Rocks are everywhere, and I'm willing to bet most of you have walked over some sort of cobblestone path before, and personally I love their design. But how do we make any shape into cobblestone in Blender? Some might model and place these rocks individually, but we're not going to do that, no no no. We're going to be growing them with geometry nodes. So here in Blender, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make any object. I'm going to go with the torus because I think it showcases this pretty well. And I'm going to set the minor radius to like 0.4. And then I'll add a subsurface modifier with control one. And then we can create a new geometry nodes group. And the first thing we need to do in here is scatter some points inside of our object. And that's pretty easy nowadays. We just go mesh to volume and then distribute points in volume. And then if I turn the density up, you can see that this is giving us a bunch of points inside of our volume. But before we simulate, there's some things we need to do to clean this up because if you look right Right here you can see that these two points are intersecting with each other um, and we don't want that if they're intersecting at the start of the simulation it's gonna kind of break and not look very good so what we want to do is we want to find any points that are close enough to where they're already intersecting and the way we can do that is with the index of nearest node so this will basically get the index of the closest point so if I just view the index, this one has an index of 40 and this one has an index of 39. And so index of nearest, they'll be flipped because they're the closest ones to each other. So at this point, we'll evaluate this one. And at this point, we'll evaluate this one. But how do we evaluate it? Well, evaluated index, pretty simple. And we want to evaluate the position, which is a vector on the point domain. And then we can take the distance between this current position and the index of nearest position. If you view this, you can see this distance is like 0 0.03. And so how do we tell if they're intersecting? Well, for that, we need a radius value. So I'm gonna just drag one out. We can actually make a set point radius node and then just drag this into here. And that'll be on our modifier stack now. So we can change the radius. What we're gonna do is say, if this distance is less than two times our radius, two times our radius and you see this will be true because if we have two points here and they're like this two times the radius would be about like that distance and so these obviously aren't close enough if we have two of them touching but not intersecting this will be exactly two times their radius so those also won't be intersecting and then if we have these intersecting the distance between their centers will be less than their radius or two times the radius which would go like here so we can this is an easy way to find out if points are colliding so we'll do a, we'll take a delete geometry and then we'll just delete ones that are in, intersecting you see those points are gone so that's very nice let's make it put this in a frame also put this in a frame. So now we need to turn these points into actual spheres. Um, so we can just take an instance on points and we'll instance an icosphere because uh, it has a very even distribution of points, subdivision up. And then we can just use the radius into the scale on this instance on points. And so that looks good to me. Next thing we need to do is realize these because we want to actually be able to interact with this geometry. And then last thing before we simulate is we're just gonna take a store named attribute node, set to vector, and we'll call this vel for velocity, we want this to be the normal vector of our icospheres. And we can scale this by like 0.01. Uh, the lower you put that number, the slower your simulation is gonna go, but the more accurate it will be. And so I'm just gonna put this stuff in frames and then we can make a simulation zone and do our simulating. So the simplest thing we're gonna do is just take a set position on the inside of the simulation zone and offset it by the named attribute that is our velocity. And so if we do that, you'll see these are growing, but they're not intersecting with anything yet. Um, and to do the intersections, it's gonna be pretty similar to what we did back here with the index of nearest, but we're not actually gonna use the position. We're gonna do something a little different. Um, you can use the position if you want totally, but this is also a different good technique you can use for stuff like this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take an index of nearest, like we did last time, and an evaluate at index node, but this time we're gonna set it to integer, and we're going to evaluate the mesh island, island index. And if you don't know what this does, it's pretty simple. This just gives us uh, one value per mesh island, which is just like each individual unconnected piece of geometry. So like this is zero, and then this might be one, this might be two, this might be three, um, but all of the points in those islands have the same value. So we can, what we can do is we can take the index of nearest and say, well, is this the same as current island index? So if we say, we take our current island index and we say, is this equal to the nearest? And we view this, you'll see everything currently, yes. But then as we play it, it gets, uh, it turns black around the intersections. And so we're gonna set this to not equal actually, so that we can find out where our stuff isn't equal and they're intersecting. So that looks like a pretty good mask to me. And then to stop it from intersecting, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna set the velocity, oops, this vel attribute, set to vector. And in the selection, we're just gonna set the value to zero. So now if I play this, you'll see the spheres aren't inter aren't interacting with themselves anymore. 
which is pretty nice. So one thing that's still going wrong is they're leaving the bounds of the original Taurus, right? They're going way outside of them. Um, and this is because they'll just keep going until they intersect with themselves. And for a lot of these points, that's never going to happen. So they're just going to keep going forever. So what we can do is take our input geometry, this input geometry, and we're going to do a little bit of ray casting. Um, so we'll use this as the target geometry on a ray cast. And then we're going to manipulate this ray direction and ray length to our benefit. So if we take a named attribute, and this will be our velocity attribute, we can point this in the ray direction and then use the length of that as the ray length. And then we can use this is hit value. If I view this, you'll see as they start colliding with the bounds of the torus, it turns white. Um, and if I just take a Boolean math node set to or and use this is hit, you'll see they're no longer escaping the bounds of our torus, except for that one, but we'll deal with that later. Um, but why does this work, right? So let's say we have a point in here and this is inside of our torus, right? Over here is inside, over here is outside. Well, if we ray cast towards the direction of the velocity vector, let's say this is it with the length of the velocity vector, we're not gonna get any hits here, right? So that's fine, we keep going, we move our point here by the velocity, and then we do it again, but this time it collides with the surface. So we can just cancel out the velocity. And if you don't use the length, then it'll just keep going forever and it'll basically always be hitting. But with this method, we can just basically trace where our point will be in the future and say, hey, did it collide with the surface? And if yes, then we stop its velocity. So I'll just put this up here and I'm gonna hide the unused sockets with control H on that. And okay, that looks good. Frame this up. But what is going on with this thing down here, right? Why is it escaping? Well, if I take our input geometry and I join it with our simulation, you will see why. So at the start of the simulation, this icosphere is already outside of the torus, right? So it's not going to collide with it because its velocity is pointing away from the torus, right? At the start of the simulation, its velocity is pointing this way, so it's not going to collide with it. So it's just keep going forever. Uh, there's a couple ways to fix this, but I think the easiest way is to just come back here at the start where we did our culling to make sure there's no self intersections. And we'll just take the input geometry and get the proximity to it with a uh, geometry proximity. And then we can say, is this distance less than is this distance less than the radius? And if so, we can take a Boolean math node, set to or, and we'll also delete that. And so now there shouldn't be anything coming out of our mesh. So this is looking pretty good, except it kind of isn't. This doesn't look very good, right? We're pretty much gonna fix that with post-processing. I'm also gonna up the subdivisions on this icosphere a little bit. That will make it less performant. Um, for me, it still runs on real time on this, but it will make it a little less performant. But most of this is gonna be fixed with a bit of post-processing. And the biggest thing we can do is just blur the position a little bit. So we're gonna take a set position, take the position, blur this with a blur attribute, plug that into the position, and you can already see that looks way better, right? These look kind of like uh, smooth stones now. And we can just take a uh, set material, or no, sorry, set shade smooth, and boom, our object is now filled with rocks. And I think it's a pretty cool simulation to watch. Uh, I can even turn the normal vector down and that'll make it go slower. And we can, uh, we can really kind of go crazy. Like if I, I want to scale this torus up, let's say I bevel this edge, scale it by Z. And then if I restart this, now we can fill this kind of saucer shape up. Um, and I think that a way to make this look better, I'm going to actually turn the radius down to like 0 0.02. Uh, and then I'm going to up the density. But I think a way to make this look better is to do another delete geometry. And then you can take a noise texture and just say, is this factor less than some value. So we'll go like 0.7. If I plug this into the delete, well, maybe 0.7 was too high, like 0.6. And then I'm gonna turn the scale of this noise down to like two, turn this down. And now you can see we get patches of areas that are empty. And then when we do the simulation, that will result in bigger rocks in those areas. And you might see with this increased radius, um, there's actually a chance. So you can see some of these are escaping like was happening before. Um, you can fix that in a couple of ways we can either improve this calculation or we can uh, change this mesh to volume. I think the easiest way to fix this is putting the interior bandwidth to zero. And then if you still have issues after that, you can increase this uh, voxel amount. Um, and that should fix pretty much everything. It's just some inac inaccuracies with the volume to mesh or mesh to volume, but yeah. That looks great. And you'll see with the noise texture, we have these areas of smaller rocks. And then like over here, there's bigger rocks. There's still some weird stuff going on down here. Like you'll see there's a huge grouping of vertices here and then they're kind of spread out here and it gives some weird pinching, which is pretty bad. So what we can do is at the end, after we've run the whole simulation, uh, I'm gonna do a bake node and I'm just gonna bake this as a still. 
because I just want this piece of uh, geometry on its own. And then I want to do some remeshing, but if I do remeshing in the normal way that most people do, which you do mesh to volume and then volume to mesh, you'll see it just turns into this formless blob, right? Even if I set the voxel amount higher, it, it's not really usable. Um, and that's because all of this is just one geometry set, right? So these will just bleed into each other. There's a pretty easy fix for this, though it can be taxing on your PC. You take a split to instances node. And what this will do is I'm going to set this to split on the uh, mesh island again. So now this turns every island into its own instance. So every rock basically into its own instance. And then you'll see if we do the mesh to volume on this, uh, and I'm, I'm going to set this to size and turn the voxel size to like 0.2. Mm, I'll go a little lower, like 0.3. 0.03. You see now each one of our rocks is getting individually remeshed, which is pretty nice. Uh, maybe you go even lower, like 0.025, and that's pretty good to me. And then you can realize these if you want. I don't really have a need to realize them, so I'm just not going to. But you'll see that this method does kind of make a lot of holes. So the easiest way to fix that is just to take a set position before the split to instances. And I'm actually going to mute all of these just so that it's not tanking my computer. And we're going to offset the position by the normal scaled by some value. So if I increase this value, you see they get bigger. And that's going to help to avoid those big holes in the mesh from this remeshing process that we're doing. And so, yeah, that, that looks pretty good, I think. So I'm going to get into showing you some other examples of stuff you can do with this. So this is one of the renders that I made with this technique. Um, and I think this is a pretty sweet effect. I basically have this kind of obsidian like material on the outside. And then I have a lava texture on the inside. And I think that gives it a very cool effect. And of course, I have some exponential glow on it I'm using the viewport compositor. And this material is pretty simple. It's just, uh, you see this texture says AK. I'm not actually using AK textures. I swapped them out. You should almost or you should pretty much never use 8K textures. I normally keep it to like 5, 12 to 1K textures, um, 2K or 4K if you really need it, but never above that, basically never above 2K. But I'm just blending these two materials. I'm blending this material, which is this obsidian, and then I'm blending that with this lava texture. Um, and I have the emission actually controlled by an attribute. And this attribute is called surface. And it's basically just what parts of the torus or what part of the rocks are on the outside of the torus. And I'll show you how to store that in a second, but I basically just invert that. Um, I invert that to get the inside. I do some mapping on it to get a harsher line. And then I use some mixed colors set to color burn to make the edges more natural. And again, down here, the other texture. And then I just mix those shaders together and boom, you got this, which is pretty sweet. Uh, I'll play the full animation rendered out. It's basically just what Blender Guru does in his thing, I think. I haven't actually watched that yet. Um, and the way that you store this surface attribute, we take this raycast, the is hit value, and just plug that into the surface. Uh, we just store that as a new attribute called surface. And that, if I just view this, oh, and I'm blurring it with some exponentiation at the end just to get a smart, smoother fall off because this is what it looks like initially. And then after blurring it and setting it to the power of four, it looks a lot smoother. Um, but this is what it looks like normally. And you can use that in a shader however you'd like. Another use case is something like this cobblestone bridge. Um, these do exist in real life. In real life, you'd have like these cobblestones would be smaller, but this is a basically the same exact node group. Um, I'm using a different mesh detection technique here. This one kind of breaks. This was this is from an older version, so I wouldn't recommend using this, but it is a good method for quickly finding out if something is inside of a mesh, um, but it does break occasionally. There's ways to fix it, but um, but you can see here, I have these rocks like this, and I'm doing, I'm scaling them by the normals, and then I'm doing the whole mesh to volume, volume to mesh with the instances, and then we bake that just to keep the performance quick, and then we blur it, and offset it by some noise. And so yeah, we do this noise displacement to make it look a little bit more like rocks. And I think this comes out with a pretty decent result. Um, as you can see, it's kind of high in poly count. So what you could definitely do is bake this out to a normal map um, with some simpler meshes. Um, and you can also, if you would like, uh, if you have the adequate knowledge, um, figure out how to delete the meshes inside of here. Because you can see, there's a ton of topology in here that we're not really seeing. 
Um, but it's useful for some cases, like if you want to do a liquid sim, I've done that before with this technique where you do a liquid sim and you have an emitter up here and it drops liquid in, and then it kind of goes through all of the cracks and stuff in here, which looks pretty cool. But if you're not doing something like that, you don't really need the mesh inside. So if you uh, want to try and figure that out, it's a fun problem to solve. You can try to delete the points inside of the mesh that you're not seeing. That's basically it. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you did, please leave a like and subscribe. It helps me out a ton. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something and see you in the next one.